Welcome back. We turn now to the fallacies of illicit presumption, whose defining feature is that they presume the truth of some claim to which they are not entitled. The fallacies are arguments with a premise, often hidden, that is assumed to be true but is actually a controversial claim, which at best requires support that's not provided and which, at worst, is simply false. These are the six fallacies we'll examine. Accident, begging the question, loaded question, false choice, composition, and division. Let's start with the fallacy of accident. When we presume the applicability of a general rule to individual cases that it does not actually cover, we commit the fallacy of accident. What makes it fallacious is an illicit presumption. The general rule in the premise is assumed, incorrectly, not to have any exceptions. The particular conclusion fallaciously inferred is one of the exceptional cases. The fallacy is the reverse of hasty generalization, which was a fallacious inference from an insufficient number of particular cases to a general conclusion. Accident is a fallacious inference from a general premise to an erroneous particular conclusion. Here's an example. Note the general rule that is stated in the first premise and the exceptional case to which it is wrongly applied in the conclusion. Premise one, general rule. You should always return borrowed property. Premise two, you borrowed an automatic rifle from Charles who threatened on Facebook to shoot his fellow postal workers. Conclusion, you should return Charles' rifle. One of the premises is a general claim about returning borrowed property. While this is true in almost all cases, there are exceptions, including the return of firearms to potential mass murderers. It is therefore fallacious to conclude that the borrowed rifle should be returned, since the case is an obvious exception to the general rule. Another way to think of the fallacy of accident is to treat it as the misapplication of a sweeping generalization. Here's a short video that explains and exemplifies this approach to the fallacy of accident. With sweeping generalization, somebody takes a general principle and applies it to an inappropriate case. The presumption, then, is that the general principle is applicable. So, to identify the fallacy, we should be able to state what the general principle is and be able to explain why it is that the general principle does not apply. So, for example, it has been reported that a three-year-old shot his older brother in the leg. He should spend time in jail to learn his lesson. In the analysis, you'd say something along the lines of, the arguer commits the fallacy of sweeping generalization by applying the principle that people who shoot others should spend time in jail to a three-year-old. But of course, this principle really is only valid for individuals who are morally responsible for their actions. Three-year-old children are not. Begging the question, in Latin, petitio principii, can be very simply defined. It's the use of the conclusion to prove itself. And so, visually rendered, it's clearly a case of circular reason. Here's the form of the fallacy. Premise, X. Conclusion, therefore X. As you can see, this is a valid form, but it is viciously circular, since the conclusion follows only trivially from the premise. Thus, the argument does not prove anything that was not already known. Here's a perfect case of question begging by none other than our 45th president. I've placed it on a loop for purposes of emphasis. On the leaks, is it fake news or are these real leaks? Well, the leaks are real. You're the one that wrote about them and reported them. I mean, the leaks are real. You know what they said. You saw it. And the leaks are absolutely real. The, the news is fake because so much of the news is fake. The news is fake because so much of the news is fake. The news is fake because so much of the news is fake. The news is fake because the news is fake. Trump is trying to foist upon his listeners a certain claim as a premise. However, the claim he's asking the press corps to accept is identical to, or presupposes the truth of, the very conclusion of the argument he's trying to make. In other words, he's begging the question, or reasoning in a circle. His justification for believing the conclusion is the conclusion itself.
The Trump example of begging the question is particularly egregious and therefore easy to spot. But sometimes the premise is not identical to the conclusion, but merely presupposes its truth, as in this graphical example. We know God exists because the book, that is the Bible, says so, and God wrote the book, so we know God exists. The problem is that in order for God to exist, we have to take the Bible's word for it, and in order for the Bible to be the divine word of God, we have to presume that God wrote it, and in order to write it, he would have to exist. So we need to presuppose God's existence in order to prove it. While the premises are not identical to the conclusion, they can only support the claim that God exists if we take the Bible as the divine word of God, which presupposes his existence. But that was exactly what we were trying to prove. Sometimes the premise is just a rewording of or synonym for the conclusion. Take a look at this cartoon. A man's wife tells him that she knows what's causing his insomnia. He's lying in bed awake all night. This is a case of conceptual circularity as opposed to formal circularity. The concept of insomnia includes the concept of being unable to sleep. Thus, the premise is essentially saying the same thing as the conclusion. But if the premise is the same claim as the conclusion, then it can't possibly provide a reason for accepting the conclusion. To close our discussion of begging the question, here's a mashup of several videos, one by David Pakman and another by Kevin Delaplante, that explain and exemplify the fallacy of begging the question. Note the emphasis that the first video places on a very common linguistic misuse. To beg the question does not mean to raise the question. Begging the question fallacy. Begging the question is a phrase we actually hear a lot, but it's misused really often if we're wanting to be accurate in terms of logical terminology. Beg the question is often used to mean raise the question or invoke the question, but begging the question actually has a different meaning. Think of begging the question as circular reasoning, which is another name for it. To beg the question is to assume in your premise that your conclusion is true in order for your conclusion to follow. You're assuming the truth of your proposition, which actually is what is in need of proof. People will often beg the question by being sneaky and rewording the conclusion in order to make it seem different from the assumption made in the premise. Fiscal conservatism makes the most sense because it's the most logical and coherent economic philosophy. Making sense is the same thing as being logical and coherent. The person making the argument is just rewording the conclusion. They're not presenting any evidence for the conclusion other than that which just restates their conclusion. In logic, we say that an argument begs the question when, in some way or another, it assumes as true precisely what is at issue in the argument. Another way to put this is that the argument contains a premise that in some way asserts or presumes to be true what is being asserted in the conclusion. Another common way of saying the same thing is that the reasoning in the argument is circular. Here's the basic logical form of an argument that begs the question in this sense. You've got an argument with premises P1, P2, and so on, down to Pn. And one of them means the same thing as the conclusion C, or asserts something that is logically equivalent to C. If this happens, then we'd say that this premise begs the question meaning that it assumes as true precisely what is at issue, namely, whether the conclusion C is true or not. We call this circular because the conclusion C is supposed to be drawing logical support from this premise, but the premise is simply restating the conclusion. So the argument as a whole involves nothing more than repeating the conclusion without giving any additional reasons to believe it. Here's an example. Capital punishment is justified for cases of murder because the state has a right to put someone to death for having killed someone else. Maybe this doesn't sound too bad when said this way, but let's put this argument in standard form. Notice that this is just a one-liner. And notice that, even though the wording is different, the single premise and the conclusion are asserting the same thing. 
After all, the state has a right to put someone to death just means capital punishment is justified. And for having intentionally killed someone else just means for cases of murder. So saying this is just like saying capital punishment is justified for cases of murder, therefore capital punishment is justified for cases of murder. But obviously this won't do as an argument. The issue is whether capital punishment is justified for cases of murder. That's the question that's being begged by this argument.